Hi students, welcome to the chapter 4 lecture, which is the cell. We're going to be covering the basics of cell biology in this chapter, and it's really going to help set you up for success in subsequent chapters, especially chapter 5, where we go into more detail about the working cell. Okay, so in this chapter we're going to be covering microscopes, an overview of different types of microscopes, as well as vocabulary that's important to know. We're going to refresh your memory about cell theory, distinguish between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell types, give an overview of both animal and plant cells, and review the main eukaryotic organelles and their functions. So in order to understand how biologists study cells, um, you have to know a little bit about microscopes because they are the primary tools with which we view cells which are mostly microscopic to our unaided eyes. So microscopes were first used all the way back in the 1600s, but since then the technology has improved a lot and we now have some pretty advanced microscope types. Magnification is an increase in the object's image size compared with its actual size. And resolving power is the ability of an optical instrument to show two objects as separate. So for example, if you had two red blood cells that you were examining under a microscope, um, basically what power is going to let you distinguish that that is not just a clump of a red blood cell, but it's actually two red blood cells. So there's going to be a minimum um, physical distance between those two objects below which you will not be able to tell that they are actually two distinct objects. There's two main types of microscopes. The light microscope is typically used in college classrooms, for example, anatomy and physiology courses. If you are covering um, histology and have to look at various types of tissue slides, you're going to be using a light microscope. And light microscopes use visible light that's projected through a specimen, which is typically a pre-prepared specimen on a glass slide. There is a lens that enlarges the image, and then the image is projected into the viewer's eyes. The minimum resolving power of a light microscope is 0.2 micrometers. So anything that's 0.2 micrometers or above, you're going to be able to distinguish that those, those objects are different from one another. If they are closer together than 0.2 micrometers, then you're not going to be able to tell that they're actually two separate objects instead of one. An electron microscope uses a beam of electrons in order to resolve objects, and the resolving power is much more fine. It's 0.2 nanometers, and biologists began using them in the 1950s. A micrograph is simply an image that is taken with the aid of a microscope. So we have a light micrograph image here of a cell. They're good for viewing living cells such as paramecium. Um, and typically with biology textbooks there will be um, a little photo caption, sometimes on the side here, sometimes on the bottom, that will show you what type of micrograph it is, and they're usually just abbreviated, like LM, SEM, or TEM. So this will just be a guide to show you um, what those abbreviations mean. There's also scanning electron micrograph images. Um, these are good for viewing surface features, such as cilia or flagella basically fine surface features of very small things, such as cells. And then we have transmission electron micrographs, good for viewing internal structures. So 
if you wanted to have um, a specimen on a glass slide that was not living, you weren't trying to preserve that specimen in that way, um, you would probably use a transmission electron micrograph. So just to refresh your memory, um, I did touch upon this in the first lecture. Cell theory states that all living things are made up of cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells. That means they don't just arise spontaneously. They arise from other cells. And the cell is the smallest unit of life that exhibits all the characteristics of life. So all of those seven properties that I told you about earlier an individual cell displays all of those seven properties of life. Cells are the building blocks of all life, and they have to be very tiny for materials to move in and out of them fast enough to meet the cell's metabolic needs. So this is an idealized plant cell here. We're going to expand upon all of these organelles here and talk about them in greater detail in later slides. All organisms are either single-celled, also known as unicellular, this is most bacteria and protists, or multicellular, such as plants, animals, and most fungi. So all of these visible objects in these pictures are multicellular. In addition to being either unicellular or multicellular, all cells on Earth fall into two categories. There's prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And these differ in several respects. This is a micrograph of a prokaryotic cell here in comparison to a eukaryotic cell. So one of the most obvious differences, of course, is size. Typically, eukaryotic cells are going to be much larger. A prokaryotic cell does not have a nuclear bound... Sorry, a prokaryotic cell does not have um, a nucleus that's surrounded by a membrane. They just have this nucleoid region, whereas a eukaryotic cell has a distinct membrane around the nucleus, and it also has organelles. So prokaryotic cells, they're generally smaller. They lack internal structures, which are surrounded by membranes, otherwise known as organelles. They lack a nucleus, but it's important to remember that they still have DNA. And these were the first types of cells. So prokaryotic cells arose on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. And they were probably similar to present day prokaryotic cells. In contrast, eukaryotic cells are larger. They contain membrane bound organelles. They contain a nucleus with DNA. And the first records of eukaryotic cells appear about 2.1 billion years ago. Here's a simplified depiction of a prokaryotic cell. We have the capsule surrounding the interior of the cell, these little extensions, which are known as pili, a cell wall, a plasma membrane, they still have ribosomes, which manufacture proteins for the cell. And again, they still have DNA, but it's not in an actual nucleus. And prokaryotes typically also have flagella, which are useful for propulsion. This is an idealized animal cell. Um, animal cells typically do not have a cell wall. They just have a membrane, and they're going to be eukaryotic cells, so they have complex organelles, as well as a membrane-bound nucleus. 
This is an idealized plant cell. Again, the main difference between a plant cell and an animal cell is the cell wall, and plant cells will also have a central vacuole, which animal cells do not. Okay, so the plasma membrane separates the living cell from its non-living surroundings. And you would have to stack 8,000 typical plasma membranes to equal the thickness of a normal piece of paper. So if you were to carefully separate all of the plasma membranes from 8,000 individual cells, stack those membranes on top of one another, that would just barely equal the thickness of a normal sheet of paper. It's mind-boggling the incredibly complex functions that the membrane carries out, yet it's so incredibly small. It's very thin. And the membrane is composed of lipids as well as proteins. Remember, lipids are various types of fats, and proteins are very versatile um, macromolecules which have a variety of functions in our cells. The plasma membrane is often referred to as a fluid mosaic of lipids and proteins. So membrane phospholipids and proteins can drift about in the plane of the membrane. They're not rigidly set in place within that membrane, but there's some movement allowed. So this behavior leads to the description of a membrane as a fluid mosaic. Fluid because things are not rigidly set in place. Molecules can move freely within the membrane. And a mosaic because a diversity of proteins exists within that membrane. The lipids within the uh, membrane belong to a special category called phospholipids. So a phospholipid is going to have a hydrophilic head. Remember, hydrophilic means water-loving. It's got a phosphate group here as well as glycerol. And then they're also going to have hydrophobic tails, which are composed of saturated as well as unsaturated fatty acids. So remember, hydrophobic is water-hating, so they are not going to want to associate with water. Phospholipids naturally form a ball in water. And in cells, the phospholipids form a two-layered membrane, which is known as the phospholipid bilayer. So as you can imagine, the environment immediately outside of a cell, as well as inside of a cell, contains um, a fair amount of water. And those hydrophobic tails within the phospholipid bilayer are not going to want to associate with that water, so they are naturally going to orient themselves such that there's the hydrophilic heads between them and the water, or the watery solution rather, the aqueous solution. So they're naturally going to form this bilayer where the hydrophobic tails are situated next to one another and the hydrophilic heads are facing either the inside or the outside of the cell. Most membranes have specific proteins that are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. These proteins help to regulate traffic into and out of the cell. So there's going to be the hydrophilic heads, the hydrophobic tails, and then there's also going to be proteins that span the length of this phospholipid bilayer that help to transport nutrients um, both in and out of the cell. I'm going to go ahead and pause here and I will pick up in the next lecture.